Welcome to A Flash of Beauty, the podcast, an audio experience dedicated to the further exploration of Bigfoot and the people Bigfoot has revealed itself to. What started as a documentary of personal narrative encounter stories and expert testimony has now shifted into a deeper inquiry into the forever changed lives of those that have witnessed firsthand this hidden truth. My name is Tobe Johnson co-producer of Flash of Beauty Bigfoot Revealed. Join me along with the crew and creators of this doc, director Brett Eichenberger, producer Jill Rimmon Snyder, and cinematographer Michael Ferry, as we go back into the trees to sit down once again with each guest in search of the truth, no matter how strange. All right, with us now is Jill and Brett of Flash of Beauty. And strangely absent is a talented cinematographer, rather, Michael Ferry. Hello, gang. Hey there. By the way, has anyone heard from Mike? Last I knew he went camping four days ago. And Ooh. He was supposed to touch base as soon as he got there. Oh, my gosh. He was last seen sipping a natty light in the woods. Yeah. And then... Uh, and I got a weird voicemail from him, actually. I just remember this. <laughs> Last night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, it was just screaming. And, oh and something to the effect all of, the it's time. all true. It's all true. <laughs> That's typical. Uh, That's straight uh, out of the Mike Ferry playbook. Mm -hmm. 3 a.m. <laughs> actually, in, in reality, Mike is, is working tonight on a mm -hmm. music video. So, you know. You know I mean, that, that whole ruse was all a lie? I was actually momentarily worried... I take it all back. He's he is missing in action. He is missing season. in Please pain. Let us know. Okay. <laughs> He's yeah, getting don't... the exclusive on the Bigfoot clan that we're going to discuss at the base of Mount St. Helens. Well, he missed a hell of an episode here. Yeah. And um, we we have, gosh darn it, you know, sometimes you got to edit a lot more than other times. This, this episode is not going to be edited up a whole lot. I thought it was going to be an edit nightmare for me. Only the guest we have on here is Kyle in the shadows and Kyle in the shadows. You'll know him when you see him. <laughs> However you stream this episode, it is a one-on-one -on -one conversation with um, someone who's a part of army intelligence at the time and um, part of a three letter agency at the time, actually he was retired at the time, a part of a three later agency. And we get into what he says in Flash of Beauty regarding kill teams that take out naughty Sasquatch, uh, probably a little bit worse than just naughty, and um, how that happens and the reality of it. And guys, we go some crazy places in this episode. I mean, it's a banger. It's a banger. Yeah, we, we go down the Sasquatch hole to be sure that didn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just renamed the episode. I thought I had the episode name down the Sasquatch hole. <laughs> and now you, you've given us another episode for Sasquatch after dark. <laughs> Gosh, That's going to happen. That's going to happen. <laughs> just you wait. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This was a well, good one though. This will not disappoint. I promise. <laughs> no. It won't. I'm still kind of coming off of it. I mean, if if everything is on the up and up, and like I told him, I just like, hey, this is bonkers stuff that you're saying right now. If you are who you say you are, this is this these are jewels, but crazy big cojone jewels you're throwing out here. And um, I'm telling you, you're gonna listen. You're gonna share this. You should be sharing all these with your friends and your relatives already. But this one. You're going to just be sliding DMs to all your exes. It's going to be, it's a great episode. It's great. a good episode. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get into it too much because of the fact that there are some legitimate surprises here. But before we do it, we got to talk. First of all, I need to make an announcement that Henry Franzoni, also um, in Flash of Beauty Part 1, has a new book out. He just announced Ooh. it uh, last night. And in traditional Henry, you know, poetry, it, it's an, it's a Bigfoot book, but you may not know it. I mean, it, 
it's awesome. Uh, the title of the book, I don't know when it's coming out. I haven't talked to Henry. Well, congratulations when you hear this, Henry. The new book is called Failing in a Cooler Way, Why I Never Found Bigfoot. I don't know when this is going to come out. Um, Failing in a Cooler Way, coming out soon with uh, with Henry Franzoni. So um, congratulations on that, Henry. Also, congratulations to Jill, Brett, and Mike. You got an award. Tell people more about it. So, yeah, so we won the Silver Telly Award, and it's an industry award for um, folks in the film and video business that um, do really good things. And um, it was an honor, and we won Best Non-Broadcast Documentary in the Silver category. Uh, of course, there's gold, there's silver, and there's bronze. Um, yeah, so that was that was pretty cool, and 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 the, part of the reason we think it's pretty cool is because of the subject matter. Um, obviously, you know, this still this subject still isn't mainstream, and the fact that we won an award in a very mainstream um, awards. Now, the Telly Awards are made by the same company that makes the Oscars. They're really heavy and they're big and they're statuettes and stuff like that. And so we're you know we're doing our best to try and put together a quality products that get out into the mainstream that people it's going to be hard for people to ignore and so winning this award is really helps to legitimize that so we're we're pretty stoked all right this is the point where i'll edit in some uh seals clapping in the background <laughs> um no congratulations on that guys <laughs> also i should mention that there is a a trailer it just popped no warning you guys just felt like hey Let's just pop something out into the ether and it is available through only social media. So if you're a fan of the show on podcast or YouTube or, you know, however you VCDs, that was something we used to buy when we were in the Navy. Um, you can uh, you can't find this trailer anywhere but on social media. And in this case, I only found it on Facebook. Uh, tell people what the heck happened in the last 24 hours with this mega drop of Flash of Beauty Paranormal Bigfoot. Go. Okay. So we released a teaser yesterday. And the reason we released the teaser is because <clears throat> the world premiere of a Flash of Beauty Paranormal Bigfoot is coming up September 6th, 2023 in Vernal, Utah at Phenomicon. So this teaser is purposely for that premiere. And it's just to get some footage out there and stuff. So we will have a more formal trailer release uh, later on as we get closer to our release date in mid-October. Okay. And we could say more after this. Um, we did make a promise to folks that in, I think we said two episodes, we were gonna release some major yeah. information about 2024. This is not the information. The, the release is nice. I mean, it's great. It's awesome. Um, it's new footage I haven't seen before, too, in it. So, But there is something coming. We can't talk about it yet, not because we don't want to, just because uh, we're reorganizing how things are going to be delivered uh, so they're in order. So we'll let you know more about that in the future. The season is actually going to maybe wrap up for Flash of Beauty Part 1 in the next couple weeks or so and um, when that happens we'll be on hiatus till after the film premiere and come back with um, Flash of Beauty uh, part two the paranormal Bigfoot which will also be Flash of Beauty the podcast here in same format we're going to be digging in here we probably have some surprises along the way as far as restructuring maybe some added voices who knows uh, maybe we'll do a round table and throw in an episode where we bring all the Flash of Beauty people into like a Brady Bunch mode and, uh, you know, talk about stuff. So we'll look into different options that you can always uh, get in touch with us on social media. Um, just reach out uh, wherever you find this podcast and all the links are in the description below. But let's get into our episode here. Let's meet Kyle up close and personal and his incredible story as a U.S. Army intelligence officer and what they do with Nasty Bigfoots. All right, with us now is Kyle, 
former U.S. Army intelligence officer. Hello, Kyle. Hi, how are you doing? Good. All right, so let's structure the show here right out of the gate, because out of all the guests we have in Flash of Beauty, we know the least about you, and we have to keep it that way. So right. as usual, we can all see ourselves on camera here. We can't see Kyle, but this is Kyle's actual voice. I, I wouldn't recognize it if I met you in the street because you got kind of a Johnny Cash thing going on in Flash of Beauty. So <laughs> it's good to have your actual tenor here. So as much as you feel comfortable, Kyle, um, uh -huh. walk us through the footage of Flash of Beauty. And um, if you want to give us some more detail of what you're describing as far as seeing these after actuaries of Sasquatch kills. Um, right. Let, let's dive into it. Go ahead. Well, you have to remember, it's I, I saw a whole bunch of those reports um, after, you know, of course, it was after action reports. And the, the interesting ones were, um, especially out of Fort Lewis, Washington, to, to believe it or not. You know, it's right in our, in our backyard. Mm -hmm. um, they would have, you know, Fort Lewis is uh, an area is surrounded by farmland. It's not too far from it. And they would get, some of these animals would get into the, get into the more rural area and cause havoc. And it got to the point where the government wanted to keep the keep that secret for whatever reason. I, and personally, I think it's over money. It had to do with if, if you can just imagine if you would uh, call this an endangered species, what it does to the logging industry, just by itself. So it, it, you have to think, you have to think of the monetary impact of admitting that this creature exists. So when they have one that is getting out of line or a group that's getting out of line, they're going to take care of that problem. And that's what the, the, these units were, were designed to do. Um, they have taken bodies to, I think for the most part, from where I can put piece together is Wright-Patterson. That seems to be their go-to area to, to, for disposal and study and things along those lines. Um, but for the most part, you know, these things are not to be trifled with. Um, from what I can piece together, and I, I've had have a personal experience when I was younger, but these are things that you have to understand. They are smarter than a grizzly bear. They're and they're, well, they're stronger than a grizzly bear, and I think they're smarter than us. So you put those two things those two things together, and it it could cause problems, serious problems. Kyle is Serious correct. problems. Um, correct. I want to I want to pause right there for a second, and I want to go back in time a little bit here. And okay. you know, unfortunately, with a documentary that's only an hour and a half with so much information, mm -hmm. we we weren't able to get into um, the rest of your interview. And and we hope to make right. the rest of your interview public. You know, of course, with your right. protection. Um, right. But I want to I want to go back in time and I want to just, you know, just as much as you feel comfortable talking about it, talk about your experience. OK. As um, a youngster, as I think when I remember you were 12 or 13 years old, right? I was 13. Yeah. OK. So tell us tell us first and foremost what happened. Well, you know, we were fishing, you know, on the Bird Creek uh, tributary there on Mount Adams. And it's a, it was a, a fishing spot. My cousin and I, and my my old my, my uncles, and we all we all fished there. And there was a hole that uh, we loved to fish because yeah, there was all sorts of you would hit you'd get you'd get your limit. You didn't have to work very hard. And at 13 years old, you'd you just, you'd rather be sleeping in your bunk than fishing. Um, so my cousin and I, we decided to go we would go fishing in this hole. Uh, it's fairly, it's not that early. It's like eight 30 in the morning. You know, it was a beautiful day there on Mount Adams. Um, I remember because where were our camps at, we could see, we could actually see the mountain. Um, so we're fishing and all of a sudden things started to get thrown at us. And we just kind of thought, okay, that's kind of weird at first. And then, it happened more and more and more. And then we started hearing vocalizations. A little, little grunt here, a little grunt there. And then all of a sudden when we look up, 
I'm looking at a juvenile. He wasn't much bigger than I was. And at some point, the parent, uh, Sasquatch, she made herself known. And uh, that was the large, that was the scariest, it was, it was, I'm 13 years old and she probably wasn't more, more than eight foot tall, but compared to me and that, you know, and she meant business like, okay, child, she was getting her child separated from us. Um, saying, okay, child, it's time for you to go. And she looked at us like, okay, it's time for you guys to go as well. That was, that was the inkling I got. And now the scary part about that is I could hear her voice in my head. Now figure that one out. Like, and I, and I felt really just that the terror and the fear and, um, you know, like I couldn't run, we couldn't get out of there fast enough. What 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 kind of an impact, psychological impact, did this have on a thirteen-year-old developing mind? <laughs> I mean, that's um, a, at, that's crazy, right? And at first, um, I wanted nothing. To, and see, I'm an, I'm an Eagle Scout on top of it. At first, there for a while, I didn't want anything to do with the woods for a couple of years. See, my dad knew my father; he knew that we were we were we were being straight. Uh, he knew exactly how honest that we were being because. When I was smaller, we had another experience. I, I, I don't really remember too much about it, but he had an experience when we were littler. We'll get into that one a little bit later. I, I, I can just tell you the story on that one. So anyway, we we run we run back to the camp, you know, at, at you know for this for this particular one, and tell Dad what's going on. So he jumps out. He jumps out like you know Paul, you know Daniel Boone, and he goes running down the trail. And then all of a sudden we have to pack up, you know, we, he packs up camp that, 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 that day. And we left. Wow. And, um, my dad is not one that is uh, fearful. He's a woodsman hunter. Um, but he, like he's, he had ran into these things a couple of times and he just, just has the opinion is these are not to be trifled with. They're not, they're not things like, you know, sometimes you see a, a person, you know, taking a, a, a photo op with a with a bison at Yellowstone. This is these these aren't those kind of things that you do that with. <laughs> right, right. Of course not. They will kill you. Dead. They, they'll never find you if they don't want you to be found. Yeah, these uh, I don't think are things to be trifled with. Now I, I'm I'm a you know and um, but growing up though, it took me a while to kind of get over it. And I don't think you ever do get completely over it, if that makes sense. You learn you learn to live with it. Okay. This is a lot for the audience. I'm glad we're here already. The audience knows you, Kyle, from being shouted, you know, shrouded in mystery. And right. that's um and now we're giving him a full can of worms that you're a witness. I, I had no idea. So here you have this image burned in your brain. Mm -hmm. And you said something really interesting here. Let's talk about the voice in your head. Because, you know, in the footage that we have in Flash of Beauty, I haven't seen the cutting room floor stuff. The impression, I think, here's a no BS kind of guy talking about, you know, an undocumented endangered species, probably. But mm -hmm. yet there's a voice in your head. So, so that implies what? Language? Oh, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you, uh, research, you know, just a quick Google search of, uh, those, that crew, that hunting crew in the seventies, I mean, um, when a naval linguist says there's, you know, speech patterns, I, I, I tend to, I tend to believe it. Um, you know, that's been, that's been studied and studied and studied. Now, what was interesting though, was whatever they, she was trying to get across to me came back in English. Now figure that one out. I mean, because you'd think that it'd come back to me in some sort of, you know, maybe half English, half something else, something, you know, something mm -hmm. else. But it came back to me um, uh, actually in my mother's voice, if I remember correctly. Wait, and reiterate what the, what the message was. Uh, the message was, okay, you guys need to leave. 
and you need to leave now. And and she goes, and then she said something, and it, it came back as, no, her child as well. Um, you need to get out of here too. And, and you need guys, and you need to leave the area. Is what desc was describe what you mean as far as this voice, because, <clears throat> and for my own curiosity, the voice in your head, your conscience, your Jiminy mm -hmm. Cricket. What what's different than the Jiminy Cricket to what you're describing? It was. It had to do with this has to happen now, no matter what. No choices in the matter. No choices. Okay. None. None. You have to get out of here. Was there a sense of, um, you said there's this urgency here. Mm -hmm. Was there something attached to that urgency? Was there a feeling, I, a sound? Was there... Um, you know, witnesses will describe a moment of panic or dread or sickness, anything like that associated with that experience? Um, I, I didn't get sick. My cousin did though. Mm. He was almost throwing, he was almost throwing up. Mm -hmm. Um, he was so sick to his stomach that he did, he, uh, he didn't know what to do. I mean, he, he's, he, we're trying to run along this trail and he's, he's sick to his stomach. And we literally had to, we had to actually stop every so often to let him throw up. Right. And yet you were unfazed. You weren't sick. I wasn't phased that way. And, mm. and see, and he didn't hear the voice in the head either, but I did. Mm. Interesting. And that, was weird, and that was the weird part. What's strange is that we hear these reports, you know, I mean, we've got in our sequel coming up, we've got an extraordinary story uh, about a guy who gets the mind speak. And, um, we also hear stories about how people will receive like pictures or images. So it's almost like they, not only are they plugged into you, but they're plugged into what you're capable of receiving. And, you know, for you to say that you heard your mother's voice means that she's like, I, I need to talk to him in a voice that he is not going to dispute or argue with, which right. to me is fascinating and kind of bewildering at the same time. It's scary too. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, if you got one that was really, really wanting to do harm to you, it'd be easy to drag you in, to bring you in though too. Right. So let's say I go into the woods, see my mom passed away last year. Let's say I go into the woods Okay, just happen to be going on a trail, you know, I'm going on to, you know, I'm going to Angel's Rest or something, what have you. And I start hearing my mom's voice. And it'd be easy, like, oh, mom, let me find you. And then I, 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 I get and I get stuck into an ambush. Mm -hmm. That It's over that quick. It's like the sirens of the sea. Yeah, mm -hmm. I we're going to the audience needs to know we're going to get to this after actuary. I'm dying to know more details yeah. here. I'm pressing right. the envelope with Kyle, but this is really fascinating territory for me personally. I think some most in the audience here are curious about this, too. After this experience, you pack up everything, you head back home. What's the topic of conversation? What's happening in the car? Is this discussed ever again? Are there any elements of surprise at home regarding this event? <laughs> My father, it was the most quietest two and a half hour drive that I've ever had with that man. We, No one said a word. There wasn't a word talked to, you know, until we probably got to past Washougal, um, they're on 14. Um, and dad said, we're going to have to tell your mom why we're home early. <laughs> and I go, okay. <laughs> I go, okay. And he goes, it's probably better that you do all the talking <laughs> because, um, I think, I think my mom had an experience when she was, uh, in her late twenties. Um, no, it was, it wasn't a really big deal. It was, just, you know, they were camping and it decided to walk in and then it left as fast as it was there. As soon as it was there, it was gone. Um, 
you know, in the in the in the fifties and sixties, you know, they, they had a lot more room to uh, navigate. You know, when it came to uh, territory. Um, so, uh, and my grandfather, he was a uh, he was a national. He, he worked for the National Park Service, um, and he helped. Uh, you know, Harry before Mel St. Helens went nuts. He was one of the guys that was trying to pull him off the mountain. Um, no kidding. No yeah, kidding. yeah, and and he were he worked at Spirit Lake for a long time. So, and you're not you're not alluding to pull Bigfoot off the mountain after the fact. No. You're talking about evacuating. Evac, yeah, evacuating. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Harry Tr- Harry Truman he just decided he wasn't going to leave when the mountain went crazy. Um, and so, uh, he literally tried to get him off the mountain before it went nuts and he just kind of refused to leave. Yeah. And he's still there. He never He's left. still there. I remember <laughs> Harry as a little, as a little, as a little guy, he was cranky. Oh, he was cranky. There's like old news reports on YouTube with Harry. Um, and the guy, man, that guy, he was full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> 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 to say the least so funny but he loved his mountain like his his wife you know well his wife was his wife was buried up there yeah 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 and yeah, his daughter you got, you got to commend him um yeah so now that we're on the topic of mount st helens um is there anything that you know that you've learned through your experience about those rumors of uh bodies sasquatch bodies being brought down um yeah those that those are true okay is yeah, there, there was talk about. Yeah, we got I and I got onto those reports on accident. Um, there was a family of uh, Sasquatch um, around this, uh, the the uh, the lava lava caves, um, and also, um, I would say probably midway up of the the climb that. What they they literally would sit up there and throw rocks at people as they're trying to climb Mount St. Helens, and we got alerted to that. And, and see, when you, when you get a, a report, you get all the old stuff that goes along with it. So I had fifteen years worth of stuff um, at that point. Well, it's longer than that. Um, uh, anyway, I ran into uh, helicopter some of the helicopter pilots' reports. Um, from the National Guard right after the explosion. And there is, there's some, um, you know, so, some um, reports that were handwritten um, with the statements of, the, of, of those report of those uh, um, helicopter pilots. And then apparently what they did was, is they, they got them these, these Sasquatch bodies into a net and they shipped them off to a facility and then they shipped them off again to uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, according to the reports. And I think they're accurate. Um, I think they said they set up a, a triage area after they figured out what they had found, and they had an opportunity to actually study these things. And they said it apparently, according to the reports, it was set up in Vancouver. They flew these things into Vancouver or over there at Ever- Evergreen, uh, the old Evergreen Airport. Evergreen Airport in McMinnville? No, Evergreen, the old Evergreen Airport in Vancouver. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Because Evergreen is a government contractor based out of McMinnville who... Right. There's a whole, that's a whole nother story. So I figured... That's a that whole you're... nother bag of worms. I don't have, <laughs> we don't have enough time here for that today. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, conspiracy theorists out there listening to this podcast episode, just Google Evergreen Aviation. <laughs> You'll have a field day. All day long and yeah, yeah. You know, Brett's been dying to hear stories about Mount St. Helens ever since I'd known him. I haven't had any stories. I grew up, you know, underneath Mount St. Helens, adjacent in the Willamette Valley down in Oregon. But it's uh, it's one of those stories that uh, we've been waiting for confirmation of somebody with a pedigree to talk about. So this is pretty cool for a lot of people listening here. I want to ask you about Brett's question here. Because had he maybe worded this in a FOIA request and used the word Bigfoot, just like when you do a FOIA request for UFOs and you don't type in UAPs, you don't get the answers you want. So, no, 
um, help people figure out this riddle. If people want to, you know, do a little sleuthing, a little gum shoeing, and be their own Dick Tracy, what's the proper way for people to actually dig into this stuff here? Because I feel like transparency is it's imminent. I mean, come on, let's let's talk about this here. I get it. Like the this could be a spotted owl moment. We we understand the nature of the beast, but what if it's not? What if it's something cooler than that? So how do, how does the public do this? What, you know, take someone like me. How do you do a, you know your own gum shoeing and looking into properly file a FOIA request to look into something like what you just described? Is that possible even? Oh, uh, yeah, it is. You just got to be smarter than they are. Um, so how how I think you'd go about it is first of all you gotta you gotta you gotta attack that low hanging fruit. And in this case, what do you think the low hanging fruit is? Flight logs. Flight logs from uh, National Guard pilots. Yes. Yes. So that's one piece of hanging hanging fruit. I think another piece, another piece of hanging fruit is finding out who the commanding officers or not really the commanding officers anymore, but who was the second lieutenant in uh, the second of the uh, 246 National Guard unit that was, you know, it was, a, it was a field artillery unit that was stationed here in Vancouver. You find, you find out who a second lieutenant was back then see, and, ho and hope the guy is still alive. And actually start trying to hey will you will you were you a part of X Y and Z and if they tell you no great move on but I think the, the big thing is flight logs finding out who the the pilots were getting those pilots to talk or even a crew chief because pilots talk they they love to talk about themselves especially especially uh, the pilots during that time because you know they, they, there should be a few of them still around. Would there be any civilian services used? Um, there was thinking, very, go there ahead. Was some. Yeah, there was some that was used. Um, uh, but they were at the time at the time they were more used for body location and recovery. Uh, when it came when it came to the civilian population, because they kind of had an idea where everybody was pretty quick. Um, and those pilot and also the, during the uh, the explosion itself, those pilots were. They were monitoring the volcano the, the, the most of the, the entire time. But I bet you, if you guys really st st uh, focused in on uh, flight logs and yeah. the narratives behind the flight logs and, the, and to see what exactly is in there, you might get lucky. I just want to point something out too that's of great interest to me in the audience. The Washington State Air National Guard um, is um, the Western Air Defense Sector, and they're basically 24-7. Um, they monitor the skies of nearly 73% of the United States and Canada, and their logo is Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if a lot of people know that. So, and I think they're based at Fort Lewis. Um, they are. Yeah. Well, they're at, they're at McCord. McCord. Okay. So, yeah. so there you have it, guys. It's right out in the open. And you can buy T-shirts and patches and stuff, and it all has it has they're really cool logos of Bigfoot. So, for all of you Air Force nerds out there that are into Bigfoot, you can Google that, and it's pretty cool that our Western air defense is being protected by Bigfoot. A question here, Kyle. Um, yes. You know, when you go on these Bigfoot outings, campouts, you get to know these clicks of bigfooters and they invite you out to the woods once in a while when you go to these groups um there's people that stand out in fact on at least one occasion i've been told about somebody who has infiltrated uh one of these groups in fact from fort lewis with uh, a very similar background to you and they're very they're very open and transparent about their their background but then when pressed about there being Sasquatch in and around that area underneath Mount Rainier, or there being kill teams. Um, it's a big no bueno, you're crazy. Um, what's the likelihood that there is, is kind of like, um, you know, a, a shell game going on in some of these Bigfoot groups? 
Well, I personally, I think there's only about 5% of those groups um, that are actually legitimate. Maybe even less. I'm talking about, I mean, there's all sorts of those groups. There's, they're all over the place. Um, I like the, uh, what's the name of that group up there in Northern Washington? I like, they're the only ones that really, I even follow on Facebook. I'll have to get you the name of that group. But the rest of them, they're just, they're, 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 I don't know what they're thinking. I think that they've been infiltrated and I think they're part of a massive mis disinformation campaign, to be honest. Why do you think that, you know, why do you think they were on TV, you know, the, um, uh, the, the found, you know, the, the finding Bigfoot folks, why do you think that was allowed to go long on as long as it did? It was a massive dis disinformation. That's all that was about. Well, now explain what you mean, because some people don't know about three-letter agencies infiltrating networks. The, talk about the reality of that. Well, the reality is, is what, what their whole job was to do was to show people ways not to find Bigfoot. There, there, or any. Okay, so let me let me go back a little further. Um, and and, and intelligence gap. You know, when you when you gather intelligence, or you're putting intelligence together. Um, there's a thing, there's a thing called, uh, mirror in imaging. So what that means is what mirror imaging is, is if you believe in something, you're going to find that, that the, the information to validate that information, even though it's not there. Um, for example, let's look, let's look at Bigfoot hair, for example. Oh, the amount of hair that people have found that um, that say that it's not, uh, of, you know, human origin or animal origin doesn't necessarily mean that it's a Sasquatch hair, right? Sometimes during the, the test can be faulty. Sometimes there's a whole, there's a thousand reasons why that, that, that hair could be come back as, uh, not of, you know, animal origin or not in the database or what have you. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. So. It, a lot more scrutiny needs to happen to make to say, "Hey, look, that's a possible Sasquatch hair." You can't just go completely off of the DNA. Now, with comparison, that's a completely different uh, different story. Now, you can compare different hairs, and you can tell with the microscope that, "Hey, look, we don't have that in our in our database." That's a completely different set of circumstances. But if you have these these groups of people that just go off completely off of D, uh, DNA, or don't understand that just because you find a footprint doesn't mean it's fake. It doesn't mean it's real. Is this it's another piece of evidence? Kyle, walk us through the process here of how this works. Uh, you get a report: misbehaving Sasquatch on Elm Street. I'm mm -hmm. just making. <laughs> yeah, I'm imagining sure. Freddy Krueger Sasquatch here. So misbehaving Sasquatch on Elm Street. What mm -hmm. what happens here as far as these teams? Okay, so at first we need to have uh, you know there's uh, a report that's made from from law enforcement, what have you. Eventually, it's going to hit the wire, and what I mean by wire is um, you got to understand that the NSA and all its other uh, other agencies um, we get a. The, the way the information is collected, it's like a vacuum cleaner. It collects absolutely everything. And then it, it gets uh, portioned out by uh, keywords. So when they're gathering these informations, for, if it's from the internet, from your telephone calls to um, other sources of information, it's, it's, it's separated by keywords. And then as the keywords, they start generating enough information, then it goes out to analysts. And analysts, all we really do, we're, we, we're sorters. We sort all, all the information out. And then at some point, it goes to your command structure. And then the command structure decides, you say, if you, I found 30 reports on Sasquatch within 20 miles of Fort Lewis. Then it goes, to, that, goes to, that, that goes to the chain of command. And then I get then I get a tasking order from there. And my task, tasking order is, may, you know, 
fi- you know, find what what is going on here. I need more. They need more information so they can make another a better decision. And then at, if once I start gathering more information, I make a nice little report. It goes up the chain of command again. And then after it goes up to my chain of command, then it goes into the military's hand and then it becomes their problem. And they, they figure out the way that they want to deal with it through their chain of command. Would there be some kind of reconnaissance, something or other? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's the military. That's a military thing, though. Would they be covert, clandestine? Would they send in possibly one of these snoops into an area to kind of pretend that they're, you know, the bug sprayer guy? Well, I don't know. No, no, paint a picture. Like no, no. <laughs> they, what they're going to do is they're going to send in probably about six to eight guys and a scientist, and they're going to and, and they're going to try to try to track these things down. They're not going to come back and say, oh, look, look, look what we found. They have a, already a set of orders already in hand if they run into them, if they find them. I was just going to ask. So, you know, sometimes uh, I know I've read reports online in some of these uh, Bigfoot forums about people camping and like the black SUVs show up at the campground uh, with guys with guns and whatnot. And this is very suspicious and out of place. Is that connected with that? Oh, that's be... absolutely yeah. So, I, you guys, you guys have been on Mount St. Helens, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yep. Okay. So you see those when you're when you're driving up the mountain, you see those big old those bar those fire barriers with the big old bars that that are those gates that are locked up. Yes. Okay. Not all of them, but there's plenty of those are locked up. Because we have bad behaving Sasquatch in those areas, and we don't want people to get hurt if they explore in that area. Not all of them. Really? Look for the re- look for the red ones next time. Okay. Oh, most of them are yellow. Sometimes white. But look for the red ones. And I bet you, if you if you interviewed somebody who's had that experience, the people with the SUV showed up because they were camped or close to one of those red ones we do not endorse people listening running up the road to red gates on mount st helens <laughs> <laughs> unless you have a gopro and send us yeah. the footage of what happens yeah it'd be fun to see if, you, if somebody goes up there and you know someone with a bag with a bag of with a with a bucket of paint <laughs> you know you know, it's not that it's not that mm. hard hard to figure out. I mean, the government is funny. Mm. Yeah. Um, Would they be know, hanging out in black SUVs at first to do recon work? Is that just um... no? They they what they they typically they do is they 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 uh, bring in that with the, with a helicopter. Uh, they'll put in like I said, six to eight guys and a, and a scientist, and they'll they'll go out they'll go out in the woods. And they have an idea of what the what the orders are. And before they probably take, before they take one out, they 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 get in, uh, you know they get in command uh, contact with their command structure. Um, they can do that easily with a seal phone. Um, it's not that hard, or even, or even over radio, or even cell phone by, but you know, with, with this day and age, you know, for the most part, depending where they're at, you know, um, it's it's easily done. Um, you you would think to be a little bit more care um in this but i don't think the government really cares if the, if 90 percent of them will get killed as long as the timber industry is allowed to make their money and that's what it comes down to now i'm old enough to remember the spotted owl thing and what kind of ha- havoc that made you know during to, to the lumber industry just imagine if you had a sasquatch that was confirmed and what would that would do to the to the to the uh, timber industry? It would shut it down mm-hmm. completely. All right, let's go back to the comment Rich makes um, in the documentary about undocumented humans and how they mm-hmm. really never have any questions for Bigfooters because they already have the intel they need that far surpasses our intel. Absolutely, um, he makes the case that this is an unclassified, feral human, undocumented human illegal alien of the ultra sense of the word 
Um, if yeah. that's happening here and we don't have just an endangered species, we have, we have endangered human. Um, I wouldn't what, classify what, him as human. You would not? No. Okay. Not even close. Not even close. There's five. And from what I remember, what I remember reading, I believe there was four or maybe even five different types throughout the country. You know, you get, to, you get down in California, you have the type that, you know, their teeth are more, you know, uh, flat. You get to the Mount St. Helens area, they're more, they're more like, not fangs, but, you know, they're sharper. Uh, bigger cone on the head. Uh, larger ears, more hair hanging down, stuff like that. There's, they're different all over the country. And to make that into a different feral human, I just can't. I, I just I can't wrap my head around that from what I from what I've learned. I think this is legitimately a um, this is an unclassified species of animal. Now, is it a gorilla? No, I wouldn't say it's a gorilla either. Because here's the thing: they're way too smart. They're way too smart. They have and they have tricks in their bag. They got a bag of tricks that uh, the gorillas, as we know do not have um we're talking about the type the type of tools they have in their in their medicine chest is stuff that you see with predators like uh tigers and lions and things along those lines we're talking about infrasound and stuff like that um i can't see a feral human having that kind of capability i just i just i don't buy it is there anything in the data set here kyle that you've looked into Maybe things you're not telling because we're not asking the right questions. You're very transparent here, so I don't think so. But um, as far as looking at the history of this phenomenon, it goes back, you know, as far as you can look into oral and written text. Uh, do you have any idea how old this species could be? Well, it starts back to the very early writings of the indigenous people. We know we know that it goes back at least from the land bridge. I mean, we know that much just just through uh, cave writings. You know, um, I just read that the other day too about how they followed the uh, the first peoples over the land bridge. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I really, I really do think um, just doing my my little bit of research that that we've done. Um, I, we do firmly believe they came from, from China at, at some point. At which some makes point sense. They, which yeah. makes sense because the Gigantopithecus is of Chinese origin. Yeah, but this isn't Gigantopithecus though either. This is something else. It might be an offshoot of uh, right. of, the, of, of mm -hmm. that. So, um, just to butt in again, real quick. So we talked. So you're talking about how you believe they're a type of animal. Um, so then, then how do you explain, I mean, you, you've, you've experienced it firsthand, the, the mind speak and some of the paranormal attributes that are equated to these things. Yeah. So, you know, at some point, you know, I, I hate to, to get into this. There is, uh, there is such a paranormal paradox with these things too, on top of it. So then it, it starts opening up another bag of questions, you know, and I don't know if it's appropriate for this particular conversation. Um, but, you know, at some point you got to start talking about, you know, uh, the UFO theory. Yes. Um, at some point. Now, I do think there's some crazies out there like that psychologist, what's his name, that psychiatrist who thinks that there's a clan that he talks to and all that kind of stuff. I think that he's, he's lost his mind. But with that being said, though, I think there is an element that we need, uh, at some point that needs to be discussed, is that paranormal side of it. Now, I don't know what that all means when I just said what I just said there. I don't, you know, that's one part of it that I am, do not have a firm understanding um, of. Because my experience was completely animalistic. But 
how these things are able to move through the forest and, um, you know, basically invisible. And all of a sudden they're, they're back, you know, you know, 20 miles, of, 20 miles away within, you know, 45 minutes. You know, I don't understand. I don't understand some of that and how they're able to camouflage themselves in the forest the way they do. I don't understand that either. Do they have abilities that we don't know about? that are more, more paranormal in nature? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Kyle, the after actuaries on UFOs, have you looked into them? And if so, some, some, um, can them. you talk about them? Uh, I, can talk, I can talk about a lot, a lot about, about them. Um, and like I was telling um, you guys earlier before we got on the air, um, you know, I'm caring less and less what the government thinks. So I'm I'm willing to talk about more than I than I was in the past. Even when we did the first film, um, I'm ta- I'm willing to talk more about about stuff now than I was, you know, 18 months ago. Is and, that because of what's happening right now in the press? What's happening in the press, and I think we're on the verge of something really bad happening, and they're going to have to um, they're going to have to admit to it. Well, you got to remember, we're we're starting as we build, as we're especially here in the northwest in the southwest Washington area, just by itself, we are beginning to build and build and build and impede and impede and impede in nature. At some point, there's got there's going to be a incident that happens between people and these things, and they're and it's going to be so big that they're not going to be able to hide it. Well, it's, for example. Let's say something happened out in Battleground, Washington. Do you think the, the Battleground PD is going to keep this thing quiet? Oh, absolutely not. They're going to be talking about it, you know, on the, on the radio before on, on the way back from the scene. They're not going to be able to hide it. And, and that's, that's what's going to happen is it's going to be one of these smaller communities with police officers that are going to be willing to talk about it right away. And, you know, and I don't you know, in this area of the country, police officers, they hold a lot of weight with their opinions and what, and what they see. And, you know, these are the same guys that we believe when they make cases against criminals. Why wouldn't we believe them if they what, what they saw or what they what they've experienced or what they have uh, investigated? Why would we not believe them over that? But we'll believe them for putting someone in jail. All right, let me double down on this question here, Kyle. Have you seen any connection between Sasquatch and the UFO conundrum? Um, Not personally, no. Not personally. Um, But again, um, when I get to, when I'm working, uh, you know, with information, um, some of that stuff could have been right there and it could have been blacked out. I may not have had access to that. What's some of the code names they use? for Sasquatch, uh, do they, they have a code name? I know at Area 51, for example, they support, you know, supposedly called the aliens, the greys, the kids, right? That was the code name at Groom Lake, the kids. Is there a name like that associated? Um, most of the time they're called teddy bears. You're kidding. No, it's that stupid. <laughs> Is that, is that, is that stupid? You just named this episode, bro. Nice. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there was a whole operation they called Teddy Bear, and it, and it stuck. Back in the, I think it was the early early seventies, I think. And ever everything I saw was, you know, was was would always go back to Teddy Bear. What do you, do you know anything about this Army Corps Engineers uh, handbook that came out in the seventies, where they? you know, listed all the different animals in the forest and, and Bigfoot is one of the ones that you should be oh, cautious of. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw, I've seen that. Um, uh, that one's hard to believe, you know, <laughs> that they would actually put that on there. Um, but uh, I'm not entirely sure why they put that on there, but yeah, the, apparently they have. And also Fish and Game did something very, very similar. Back in the seventies. Interesting. Interesting. And and government agencies, from my experience, don't 
ha really have a sense of humor. <laughs> Not really. They're stupid sometimes, but you know. No comment. They're stupid. <laughs> Kyle, when it comes to whistleblower protection, one of the things that it discussed is if you if you um, take an oath over something illegal, you can break that oath because it's an illegal act. And this is the basics of whistleblowing. And uh, now the protection of being a whistleblower, that's what we see with this uh, uh, intelligence officer, David Grush, who's talking about back engineered off world vehicle and pilots of said right. vehicles. So right. des describe to the audience wh what that is. If you take an illegal oath or sign an NDA, can you break that oath and be protected now? Um, my understanding is yes, you can be protected. Depending on if you follow the, the rules when it comes to uh, disclosing um, mm -hmm. such information. Um, a lot of that, it has more legal speak than I am, um, than I am knowledgeable of. Um, there's a, there's a whole group of lawyers that are starting to get into this in Portland, uh, just on whistleblowing statutes and things along those lines. Um, but my understand, my understanding of it is if you, if, there, if someone gives you an illegal order, just like in the military, an, an illegal order, uh, you do have that res responsibility not to follow said order. And when it comes to things on the, on the civilian side, it's the same way. You have protections. If someone's making you sign something ag against your will and it is not legal in your, in your, in your frame of mind and your understanding, you do have whistleblower protection. Now, it's different when you would say, let's say somebody, oh, well, during the Clinton administration, uh, decided to host the, the the instructions of a nuclear bomb on the DOE uh, on the DOE website. Um, that was real. That was real bright of them. Um, that is more criminal in nature. That you wouldn't have much of a say so in that. But something like along the lines of, I guess if I know they're holding it back uh, information on Sasquatch just because of the uh, the, the timber industry and the timber lobby. That's a different story. We haven't talked about how they take out the Sasquatch. So do you have any idea how a Sasquatch is killed? Is it by traditional means? Um, yeah, it is. Um, they typically will have a Black Hawk helicopter flying at about, you know, five to 6,000 feet looking for heat signatures and they're and they and they are more uh nocturnal um in nature um and when they get a good when they have a good idea where that group is then they send in the sniper team and the kill team you know it's um it's kind of like hounds to the hunters you know they'll set up some snipers in particular points and the and they'll get um, some ground troops to drive them to the snipers. Um, it's it's a typical you know tactic. Um, they, they call I do know they call it hounds to the hunters. They literally use you know like six guys as uh, to drive those things out into a particular area. And, and the sniper team, well, you know, they'll they'll be set they'll be set up waiting for them, and it's sad. You know, how would you feel if someone decided to walk into your house and put your feet on, put their feet on the on your on your on your table while watching TV? You know, it's no different. I mean, we're it's their home. It's their yeah. home. Yeah, we talk about this very frequently. You know, about the respect level when you're out there mm -hmm. and and whatnot. Yeah, it's all real hard to believe. You know, I'm I'm. I'm listening to this story outside of my myself and taking it all in. It's it's just a it's a tough one for the newbie for, for sure. It's a tough one for the newbie, even the seasoned person. Talking about five types, talking about kill teams, um, but yet these stories persist as much as the orbs and the lights and the infrasound. 
And the two people that come to mind here are these intimidators, these a-holes that come to knock it on yeah. people's doors, the tough guy straight out of, you know, MMA school and the little pencil dick that shows oh, up. Oh, and they will yeah. scare you. Right. Yeah. They will so these guys you. show up. Talk about who these guys are. Are they DOD? Are they contractors? What's going on? They say with the, with the Department of Interior, what's going on? Well, you got to understand, the majority of them come from teams. They either come from SEAL teams, they come from, they're, 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 they're trained indiv individuals and very dangerous people. And they have the ability to hurt you. So don't, don't forget that. Uh, will they? I think it's more of a scare tactic for the most part. But there has been people who have just disappeared throughout the years, all of a sudden. And, uh, you know, you, you can always kind of wonder, do these individuals have something to do with it? Well, they may have. Um, the th thing that is, is when something like that happens, that is compartmentalized way above anything that I would ever see. And um, they are very highly trained people. They are people who are know how to use manipulation. They are people who know how to, you know, administer pain if you, if they need to, and they know how to kill somebody and hide the body if they need to. And but is their is their main frame to intimidate and to assassinate character to set people up for the fall? It seems like oh, that seems to be the initial kickoff. That's, you know, that's the initial kickoff. Yeah, absolutely, that's exactly what they do in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But if you keep on flapping your lips and um, talking more and more on thing on subject matter or in a uh, you know in a method that they feel that is not what you should be doing. They will get. They will try to get other orders from up the chain of command. It's all real. It's, it's all a, real. It's all real. And again, and I keep on. You know, I keep on. And I beat this. Uh, mm -hmm. Beat this horse during the film, and I'll beat this horse here again today. It's all about the senators and the the Congress people who get the majority of their money through the timber lobby. Pay follow the money. That's all you have to do. Follow the money. Follow the senators who are getting millions and millions of dollars from the timber lobby. That's all you got to figure out. And then, and then you can you can build a you you can start putting think pieces together on mm -hmm. your own once you figure out all the players. I want to go I long for a second here, Brett and Jill, because we haven't talked about Wright Patterson. This is sure, sure. this is the epicenter of where the kids are taken right this is right Ro roswell mythos they were taken to right pat so do you have any data or intel uh or speculation that sasquatch is being studied for their given natural ability like things like mind speak speed cloaking things like that well the thing about it now you just mentioned now if you put everything together let's start putting things together now why would they be taking these things to Wright patterson uh, like they did for the the kids like they did for uh, ufos uh why is everything going to wright patterson air force base it, it has to do with extraterrestrial extraterrestrials that's a funny one why would they why i mean you'd think like uh if they found a sasquatch it would go to more of a university type base like uh matt you know some sort of medical center within the military in, 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 installation why is it being sent there like for example, I mean, I mean, I know there's places at Fort Lewis if they wanted to set up shop for a, mm -hmm. um, you know, to study an animal, they could do it without people even knowing. You know, any old bunkers we have back there that used to have, you know, used to ha carry munitions that are empty. They don't have to send that thing to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. They're putting it all there in one little spot for a particular reason. What that reason is, I I don't know, but it makes you go hmm. It's enough mm -hmm. information to go hmm. So yeah. what's, what's, what's the connection? Well, you're drawing a lot of connections here. You're, I mean, in a way, you're you're putting all the dots together here and coming out with a very strange Sasquatch with a UFO over the top of it by the end of the day. But yeah, I hear out of you that, you know, we have an 
more of a natural endangered species thing. Is there a struggle within you to lean one way or how are you handling this conundrum? I mean, we're all, we're all dealing with it to a degree. It's really hard. It's really hard. Um, and this is something I struggle with all the time. And this is not just here today. Um, trying to put the, those pieces together and what, what those pieces really mean. Um, I think there's very few people on this planet that really know all, the whole story. You know, and I'm talking about less than t- probably 10 people. Um, my personal opinion is that I think there are an indigenous, indigenous here to, to this world but I think they're highly watched. And I think they've been given or developed tools through the years that kind of have a, you know, a paranormal flair to them, especially when it comes to their, their camouflage abilities. Um, and now, and, and speaking of camouflage abilities, you know, there's all sorts of things that the government's working on that is very similar to Sasquatch ability to kind of disappear. We have aircraft now that is being developed. Um, you know, you, you can find this information out on in white paper and um, you know popular ma- magazine articles um, that are pretty reputable. That you know we're we're, we're starting to deal with, to get into um, uh, camouflage stuff for our aircraft that is based off of mirrors. And um, personally, I think they're camouflage ability is based off that same type of technology is they have ability to press out their environment so they may be standing right there and no one knows it kind of like the predator you know unfortunately as i guess that's the best way i can explain it which is exactly how people describe it and um, Mm -hmm. you know in the sequel to our film uh, to the first film Paranormal Bigfoot, we've got some video, some famous video of Barb Shoops that we take a closer look at. And it's exactly that. It's it's the, it's a humanoid shape that distorts. Distorts, yeah. The environment around that, that, it. I, I, now, let me go back to that a little bit because I can talk about this one a little bit. Um, and uh, 1999, um, there was a group of hunters that went out uh, to the uh, Mount Hood National Forest. Now, they had, they were hunting elk out there, and they had an early snow that year. And they were following um, some uh, um, elk track. And all of a sudden, there was this big old, you know, a Sasquatch light looking track following the same tracks that they were following but the thing that was was there they saw the tracks being actively being made right there in front of them like a ghost and that's what they called it was it was like a they called it the ghost bigfoot now that's out yeah yeah and and that's not the only time it was the thing of it was it was it was still pretty it was like midday but there they said that there was nothing there but yet there was something there um, and the way they, uh, they described it was like, it was like distorted. Now, figure yeah. that one. Which is, <laughs> I, I brought this, I, I brought this up the last couple of episodes. It's the exact same way that this 15 year old kid, Angel, in Las Vegas, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story or not, but I it's the exact same way he described the aliens in the backyard. He said you could look at them, but you couldn't see them. They were blurry. Right. That's when I knew he was telling the truth, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. And, would you know, that, well, let me ask right. you this, Kyle, and getting to your question too, Brett. You know, would 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 the government be actively trying to set up disinformation of a fake Bigfoot event to steer a narrative the same way they would with ET stuff, like this Angel Kid? You know, this this event happened two days before this Grush whistleblower or the day of. Grush's uh, televised interview within 24 hours, this whole event happened. And then Dr. Greer, I think, had his press releases, three and a half hour uh, whistleblower. So would the government be interested in setting up, you know, a publicity stunt of sorts for Sasquatch? Well, well they could, but uh, I think it got too far out in front of them. 
Uh, I think they got over head. I think they got over their skis a little bit. The there were things that came out they weren't prepared for, and they have now had they've had to backtrack on some stuff. And I think they've they've lost their window to be able to do that. To be honest, you know, and I, I'm thinking the, the truth's going to come out. I my opinion in the next 36 months. I think we're we are so close for stuff happening. You know, stuff being you know, honestly being told it's going to be, and it's going to be mind blowing. Agreed. Agreed. hundred percent. The clock is ticking 36 months. We're going to be back with months. Kai. I, mean, I, like I think, it. yeah, I think in that, and that would be at the longest because you're going to, because you're, you're going to start seeing particular, you know, pay attention to what's going on in the, the, uh, uh, Senate in the, in the United States Congress. Uh, for the folks that come or who are retiring or coming out of politics, who have had a lot of money in the timber industry, you're going to see some dudes retire here all of a sudden, and the new folks are not going to have that same kind of. Um, they're not going to want to protect the timber folks like like some of the other congressmen and senators have out of Oregon and Washington, especially. Okay. Pay attention to that. Our guest today, Kyle, ex-U.S. Uh, Army Intelligence. Uh, a pleasure today, Kyle, and we will be calling you up in, in probably 36 months or less for sure and yeah. uh, having a, a virtual beer, if not a real beer. Maybe you'll come out of full oh. retirement and uh, <laughs> we can do a televised uh, debriefing. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, don't go anywhere. I want to talk to you uh, after the air here about a few things. Okay. And um, that's it. Any last words, Jill and Brett? I, you know what? I've just been kind of spellbound just listening to this, this, uh, this talk. Um, and I remember, Kyle, when Brett and I had our initial phone call with you and you put everything out there. I remember like, when we when we ended the the call i just sat there for a while and it was just it was uh i just had to sit with all that information and i feel like i'm i'm having to do that again um there's just so much we don't know and there's so much that is known that is kept from us and uh, that 36 uh, months cannot go by fast enough yeah i, I mean I, I really do think that's a, an appropriate timeline um like I said, you're going to start seeing some people coming out of Congress and it's going to blow us away. I agree. I agree. Well, we, we appreciate your, uh, your transparency tonight, Kyle. And, um, thank you for, for coming on here and talking to us and a lot of information here to digest. And Jill's right. I mean, that night that we had that phone call, we were traveling. I don't remember where we were. We were in California. Or yeah. You're in California. If I remember yeah. correctly. But anyways, I remember Jill and I were kind of like in a trance the whole next day. <laughs> there was just a lot to digest, and I, I'm sure that's going to be a lot. for the folks listening tonight. But um, yeah, so we, so we shall continue this conversation sometime in the future. But in the meantime... Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, Kyle. That's it, folks. We will see you next week. This has been a Resonance Production Podcast. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, you can email us at BigfootRevealedPod at gmail.com. Also, if you're just discovering the Flash of Beauty universe, you can watch our documentary on most major streaming platforms.